Welcome back, and please remember that you are encouraged to submit questions via that Q&A button on the right side of the Zoom screen. So I'm now joined by the filmmakers, Summer Royal from Hawaii, Sophia Alamon from Ohio, and Juliana Aleva from Pennsylvania. Welcome. Summer, I'm going to start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about the inspiration for your film? And, I, you know, it's international in scope. And were you concerned at all about finding footage and images sufficient to tell your story? Yes, of course. I'll address the first part about inspiration first. I've done National History Day projects for several years now. And one of my past projects was about the Soviet side of the space race. And when I was researching for that project, I read about Cherskova's accomplishment. So this year, when, or I should say last year, when National History Day announced that the topic would be breaking barriers in history, her flight immediately jumped into my mind. And when I went to nationals for my space race project, I was fortunate enough to be able to visit the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. And I saw this small four by six photograph that showed the cosmonaut group of the early space race. And it caught my attention because the annotation on the photograph listed the cosmonauts' names and stated that all but Cherskova were military pilots. And there was absolutely no other trace referencing the first female cosmonaut, Cherskova. And I felt that her accomplishment deserved a much greater recognition for breaking barriers on so many levels. And I actually originally wanted to focus my documentary on the Soviet side but during my research, it became extremely obvious to me that her flight broke barriers, not just in the Soviet Union, but also in the United States. And once I realized that she doesn't even have an authorized biography written, I wanted to dedicate my project and my documentary to memorializing her achievement. And as for the difficulty with research for this international topic, I actually felt that it was rather easy to locate footage and images despite the fact that it was not a local topic. And the reason for this is because I relied heavily on contemporary magazines like Life, Time, Look magazines, and the Ladies Home Journal. And this allowed me to get a complete picture of the times since these were magazines that people were reading exactly in the 60s. And also advertisements and letters to the, ed uh, to the editors were extremely helpful in seeing how people reacted to this information. And it was helpful in getting myself better acclimated and understanding these times in their own context. And so my whole point was to go beyond the general public's knowledge by using these contemporary sources. And as for footage of Valentina's flight and the still images of her different life stages, it was relatively simple because her achievement was highly publicized in the Soviet Union, I could easily turn to state issued propaganda footage to find these images. Great. Sophia, how about you? you how did you come to your topic and how did you wind up narrowing it down to the Rural Electrification Administration? Uh, yeah, I actually had no idea what the REA was until this year, which I think it's crazy because it's such an important part of our history and I feel like we definitely should know because it's repeating itself so we need to like learn from our past mistakes and do better <laughs> um but I always loved the new deal in like social studies class and like I've always been interested in FDR and um I wanted to do something along the lines of him for this year and I started with the fireside chats um but as I was researching for the fireside chats, I found the REA and I thought it was so interesting. And I really just wanted to tell that story. And I was so passionate about it. And that's why I didn't get sick of learning about it. And I still love learning about it now, even after my documentary is finished. So uh, yeah, I think it's crazy that I winded up doing it on the Rural Electrification Administration, but very happy I did. Great. And so, Juliana, you had a particular focus on local history. So what were the main resources that you used and how did you keep all of your research organized? Um, yeah, so 
I did a lot of research at um, a local archive um, in Philadelphia because my topic was local. There were a lot of resources that I could um, easily access um, to keep it all organized. Um, if I had stuff in um, online archives or um, in-person archives, I would just try and um, organize so that I knew what images and what videos went with what part of my documentary because um, I was telling the story of Leon Sullivan and he did a lot of different things. So it was important for me to make sure my resources were organized into what um, accomplishment I was talking about with him. Great. I'm, you know, uh, really, you know, curious back to you, uh, Summer, for a second. Um, uh, one, we have gotten several questions uh, in the chat. And again, I encourage people to submit their questions. Uh, about the kind of resources that you're going to, specific resources to look for uh, footage and, and images and, and things like that. So in yours in particular, I mean, I even saw that you had like, you know, wedding film uh, in there. So I'm sort of curious where the, the kind of places that you were going uh, to, to find uh, uh, the footage that you used in your documentary. Yes, so for the American side, I was able to purchase magazines from Amazon or eBay. The same magazines that I mentioned previously, like Time and Look Magazine, were especially useful in getting advertisements. And as for the Soviet side, the Soviet government, because this is a form of propaganda, in their archives they have this footage of Cherskova's wedding and her other accomplishments like the ticker tape parade. Okay. So, Sophia, with yours, you had some very striking images from uh, REA posters. Uh, I'm curious about those. You used excerpts from, uh, I don't know if those were uh, Franklin Roosevelt fireside chats or State of the Union addresses or whatever, but I'm, I'm curious where you got that audio. And then how did you decide where to put them in the film? Had you kind of created a outline or, a, you know, an, an editing decision list or, you know, exactly how did you decide to put that together? Um, I think the two places I got like the coolest resources were the State Library of Ohio. I found a lot of articles and graphs and like pamphlets and stuff in the Federal Propository, I think it is, and those are really awesome. I used a lot of those in the beginning of my documentary um, just to like lay like the groundwork of what my project was about and like the information behind all of it. And then I went into more of pictures of farms and families who now had electricity. Um, other than the state library, my probably number one is the Library of Congress the website, um, that's where I found those posters, their veal posters, very vibrant. And I felt like it brought like the whole energy of the documentary up a little bit because a lot of my other images are kind of somber. So I really loved using those. Um, so yeah, if there's any students that are thinking about making a documentary, like, like from kind of, cause it was in the 1930s. So that isn't as like, present as some of the other ones, then I would say definitely go to the Library of Congress website because they have the best everything, all the best resources, and then local libraries too. Thank you very much for the Library of Congress shout out. Uh, Juliana, you're, uh, again, with your local fo uh, focus, I'm, I'm kind of curious the kind of resources that you use that, you know, might uh, spur a student watching us now who's thinking about local history to think about the kind of resources in their community that they might be looking for. So, you know, where, where did you go for your research? And you also had interviews uh, in there as well. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, as for resources, I definitely used local archives a lot. Um, it's crazy the amount of information that you can find at an archive, especially when uh, your topic is local. There's like piles and piles of stuff to go through. Um, and as for interviews, I was able to contact people because um, if they were very close to me and it was easy to um, get in touch with people. Um, and then they, from there, got me in touch with other people. And it was a really great experience to be able to build kind of a 
community based off um, my topic. And I got to hear great stories um, from people um, who impacted the history of my own city. And so if you are thinking about doing a local topic, um, using the people in your community and the resources in your community is a great way to do that. Fantastic. Um, Summer, I'm curious, what software did you use to uh, create your film? We've gotten several questions about editing software. And in particular, your film, uh, you know, is, it's full of music and uh, some very interesting graphics, like those nesting dolls that you put in the corner. So I'm curious, why did you make those creative choices? As for the software, I use Sony Vegas Movie Studio. And at the time that I first got it, Sony owned it, and it was a free trial version that I was able to download. However, over the years, the program was sold several times. So now it's actually not available as a free trial. But even today, if somebody were to purchase it today, I believe it's only $45 for the licensed program, which pales in comparison to other movie, movie editing programs that could cost in the hundreds. And as for my graphics, uh, for the nesting doll, what I did is I got a blank um, Matryoshka doll set and I painted them myself and put a screw in the back so that I could use pliers to pick it up and move it. And I painted the pliers green and I used a green screen or I should say I painted my wall green. And then I put up a shelf so that I could stand below the shelf so that I wouldn't be in the shot. And I just picked up the heads and moved them across. And because I had a green background and the pliers were green, I was able to edit out the background and add that as a new layer on Sony Movie Studios. And that's one of the great features about this movie editing software that you can have many, many, many layers. And that's exactly how I did my animations that I just added new layers. And I think by the end with everything cooked down and boiled down, it was about 20 layers that I had. So with my animations, what I do is say, for example, the flipping of photos, I can have that as one video and overlay that on top of the background information that I'm presenting and use a transition to that specific layer that doesn't affect the other layers in the background. Great. Sophia, did you have a background in video editing at all uh, when you came into this? And I'm also curious how your film evolved through the competition process. Uh, well, my answer to this question is a lot different than summers probably <laughs> because um i just used imovie on my mom's old 2011 macbook and i used a microphone that i think was probably for guitar hero or something and um i don't know i just like did the best i could and i made it work and obviously it worked out pretty well but um if anybody's watching and like are intimidated by um like big words, like, because I am too, because I don't really know. <laughs> I don't have a fancy editing software, but no, you can definitely do it like with whatever you have, you have because I've never done anything like technical before. And I really just loved my topic so much and really wanted to do a documentary. So um, I just did the best I could, but I will be upgrading from iMovie for my next documentaries. <laughs> um, but my documentary that I turned in in May for the national competition was a lot different from the one that I submitted for regionals. There's like, I didn't even tie it back to rural broadband and healthcare in the beginning. Um, I found that like throughout the process and that's one of my favorite parts about my documentary. So it's never finished. I don't even think it's finished now and it's already turned in, but you could always do more. Well, that, that, I think that feedback that you get seems to be very important. That's certainly a theme that I've heard again and again from uh, you filmmakers. Uh, Juliana, can you uh, talk a little bit about the importance of feedback uh, that you received in improving your documentary? Yeah, um, I got a lot of feedback. Um, my uh, history teacher, my amazing history teacher, Miss Taylor, she helped me so much with feedback and gave me like second, like the exact second of something that she wanted to tell me. Um, I showed it to my history class, which was really scary, um, but it was super helpful because they all gave me feedback. Um, showing it to friends and family 
Um, I showed it to people who I interviewed to, you know, see how, what they thought about it. Um, feedback is so important because when you work on something for a long time, it's kind of hard to see certain things that other people would probably pick up on. Um, and also being able to like take feedback and then transform it um, in your own way and use that feedback and creatively like change your documentary um, is something really cool and feedback is super important, really helpful. Uh, we have a question in the uh, chat, which I, I think might have arisen from actually viewing all three of your films. Uh, why do you think people should know and care about your topic? Why should it matter in the 21st century? And all of you, I think, did a really, really good job of sort of tying your, your films to things that are going on today. So, uh, Summer, would you uh, start? Yes. Um, I think that there is a strong connection with my topic to the present, where in the post-World War II era, women were not employed in a long list of professions. And during my research, I found out that the former Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor graduated from Stanford Law School and was the editor of a very prestigious Stanford Law Review, sorry, Law Review. Yet upon graduating, she sent her resume to all the major law firms and nobody would hire her simply because she was a woman. And eventually someone offered her a secretarial job and she had to prove herself for quite some time before she could even practice law, despite graduating at the top of her class at a very prestigious law school. And today this experience is unimaginable. But with that said, even today, women still only earn about 70 cents for every man's dollar. So I think that it's these stories from our past that allow us to reflect on the changes we've made in the past and how we can move forward with very similar problems that we still face today. And of course, we've made major milestones and movements in changing some of the injustices that we've faced in the past. But I think that this particular topic is one example of an issue that we still see um, little speckles of here and today in society. And so I think it's important to learn about the past issues of this topic. Sophia, how about you? Um, well, I truly believe that history repeats itself, um, not even with my documentary with um, rural broadband and healthcare, but with the penicillin in the junior category too. Um, and it's really important to bring light to these topics that maybe haven't been brought up in so long and because they can teach us new things that we can learn from. And I think it's really, really important because I never would have known anything about rural broadband and healthcare if I didn't do this documentary and find this topic. And I'm very thankful I was given this sort of outlet to like show people that history does repeat itself and we really need to learn from that. And it's not even just like, rural broadband, it's like you can tell, like everything that's going on in the world, we really just need to come together and realize that if we've made this change before, we can definitely do it again. Thanks. Juliana, it, you know, is this, has your documentary changed you? Has it made you feel more a part of your community? Um, yes, definitely. Um, there's a lot of civil rights history in Philadelphia that I still don't know about and I didn't know about a lot before I did my documentary. Um, even just like going by certain places in Philadelphia, Progress Plaza is a place that I passed by so many times and I had no idea the historical significance of that place. And being able to talk to people who experienced these events firsthand um, really just I don't know, opened my eyes and um, made me appreciate the struggles that other people go through um, and made me look at the ways that Leon Sullivan tried to, you know, break barriers and how we can replicate um, his motives and try and break down the barriers that we still have today. Uh, I asked this of the, the juniors as well. So you guys finished your documentaries uh, during a global pandemic. Do you have tips? for uh, some students who are watching us that have to, they're facing those very same challenges now, Summer? Well, I think for me, my answer will probably differ a little bit from the others because I did not choose a local topic. 
So as far as my research goes, it didn't affect me too much that I was doing this in a pandemic since most of my resources I either had to buy on Amazon or research online since I wasn't going to any local archives or any local areas of research. And I think um, someone in the junior division mentioned that it's important to re reach out to those who you need help from. So for me, what I do because I'm isolated from my resources, uh, for example, in the past, I've contacted Khrushchev. And I think that my biggest advice for students watching this would be that if you feel that you don't have the resources where you are, don't be afraid to reach out and ask for help. All the time, curators are more than happy to bend over backwards, looking something up in their museum and sending it back to me because people want to help students who are trying to educate themselves and gain an understanding about the exact topic that they are researching themselves. And so I think that I guess my advice would just be to reach out to others and to look for resources online that would be available even in a pandemic. I can uh, certainly second that as somebody who is occasionally used as a resource for documentaries like this. The, the problem with asking a subject matter expert like me is getting us to shut up. Uh, so uh, I think that that's extremely uh, good advice. Uh, Sophia, uh, any, uh, any advice that you have for folks working in a pandemic? I think the most important thing to understand is that communication really is the key to understanding, which is the theme for next year's History Day project. <laughs> but, and I think we've learned that um, through all of this too, like Zoom interviews, and I'm sure we wouldn't have been able to communicate um, as much, like I guess as openly as we have because we've had so many Zooms and we've watched all, all these documentaries and I've been able to come in contact with so many amazing people through Zoom and I interviewed Jeffrey Urban from the FDR library and maybe that wouldn't have happened if I wasn't emailing with him like back and forth and had the ability to do it on Zoom. So I think it's really important to remember that as hard as these times can be, like maybe there are benefits because I think this, what we're doing right now with the Zoom and everything is pretty amazing, so. So uh, as we uh, get near the end of our conversation, uh, I'll just ask a really simple question. I'll start with you, uh, Juliana. Was it fun? Yeah, it was. It's um, definitely a lot of work, not gonna sugarcoat that. But um, when you get a topic that you're really passionate about and really interested in learning about that makes an impact on you, you actually want to keep going and keep learning. And um, it was really rewarding for me to learn how to um, figure out my own creativity in a documentary and meet a lot of great people. So it was a lot of fun. Fantastic. Summer, how about you? Yes, of course. It was definitely a lot of fun. And I just want to echo her in saying that I think it's really important that you choose a topic that means a lot to you, because I think for everyone here, this topic has somewhat grown a part of our lives. Like it's it's exactly what we want to tell people about. And so I think that when you're doing something that feels like it's a part of you, you never want to stop researching and talking about it and learning more about this topic. And so, of course, if I was given a different topic about something in ancient Greece or something that I didn't have as much interest in, then no, it wouldn't have been fun. But because I love my topic and I love everything about my documentary and I never want to stop working on it, it was fun for me. Sophia, how about you? Yes, this is amazing. And I've said that so many times, but I'm so thankful that I have this opportunity to meet so many amazing people. I couldn't imagine like speaking to Ken Burns, but <laughs> it's all crazy. Um, and it's so fun. I'm so thankful. Fantastic. Well, it's very inspiring and I've really enjoyed talking uh, to all of you. Uh, Summer, Sophia and uh, Juliana, thank you so much for spending time with us today and giving us your insights and really congratulations on your achievement.